This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 6th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the question that those urging restored government spending, such as doctors and university supporters, to pick a couple that have made the papers in recent days, need to be asked. Second, how so-called conservative Senator Chris Birch is urging his fellow legislators to ignore the law. And third, why none of the so-called spending caps, neither the governors nor the legislatures, work actually to match spending to revenues. And now, let's join Michael. Is Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He is uh, a former oil and gas consult attorney and all-around good guy. He comes in every week to talk with us about what we call his weekly top three. And those are the big three items that are uh, that he thinks we should be paying attention to as Alaskans. And uh, again, like I said, he obviously wants to see my blood boil because he wants to revisit the whole doctor thing from yesterday uh, as number one. Good morning, Brad Keithley. How are you, my friend? Michael, I'm doing great. Yeah, I just I uh, I, I didn't really realize when I put that down uh, or when I put that on the list that it was going to be a repeat of your of your segment uh, last segment yesterday, but. It's uh it's it's worth going over again. Oh, I'm sure it is. Yes, yes. Brad is gleefully <laughs> cackling in the background. No, I mean, I'll be honest with you, Brad. I'm I'm glad you brought it up because again, I ran the clock out yesterday on this topic, and I will say I will say a couple things before you run into it. And and first and foremost, it is this idea that obviously is permeating a big slice of the population in that room, which is essentially government knows better than you how to spend your money. Oh, you poor, poor, pitiful children. If you, Governor, really knew what was good for all of these people, you would take this money from them that they would use to spend on big screen TVs and snow machines. You would see fit to take that money and put it into their health care, which is probably one of the most insulting comments I've ever heard, uh, you know, directed towards the public at large. Take it away, Brad Keithley. Well, you, uh, I mean, you, you analyzed it correctly. It's not, it's not really put it into healthcare. It's really put it into our pockets, into the, into the, into the medical industry's pockets uh, right. is, is what's going on. I mean, that was a special interest group every bit as much as, as a university special interest group or as a, as a K through 12, you, you certainly can, and they certainly do paint these things in, 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 very great uh, format about you know how it's really all about all about the kids or all about the healthcare or all about the university students, but it but it's a special interest group, right? I mean they they're they're in there because they've got Medicare patients, Medicaid patients, um, and um, and they want you know they want their funding and 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 it's a, it's a request every bit as much uh, of that. Yeah, well, and and I think that's the thing that people misunderstand. And I mentioned this yesterday, but you know, this is what happens if, if a lot of those doctors are like, "Well, this is what I mean." My practice is all my practice is built around this stuff, and I'm like, "Well, that's your problem." Just like those contractors who are out there who've built their entire business model up around government capital budget spending and everything else are in panic mode when the capital budgets get cut. This is the problem when you become a dependent. On government, whether you're you're part of some program and have to take, you know, housing assistance or something else, or whether you're a provider for those things and government spending gets cut, it's basically welfare at both ends of the system. 
Yeah, exactly. There and, and it wasn't only the doctors. There was uh, uh, this past week. It was there were there were various other pieces when you you know run through the papers uh, of 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 pleading for for this or that. Another one that really got me going sort of was was my equivalent of of your doctor story was a was an op ed that Joe Beadle, a guy who I really respect and and have have a, a great deal of admiration for, former uh, uh, president of Northrum among other things. Uh, wrote an editorial that appeared in in all of the papers uh, uh, titled "Alaska Needs a Strong University," and it really was a plea uh, uh, for a strong university. And there's a, you know a funding, refunding, or fully funding, or whatever the hell you want to say, funding of the university. And there was a, a a line in there about oh we don't need you know we don't need these massive PFDs. We need to you know fund the university. So it's it's you know fun fund my favorite thing. And he went and he went through. You know, a couple of paragraphs of how much he and his family had given to the university, and there's an endowed chair in his name, and he'd worked for the university, and and went through you know how much he had personally done for the university, all of which I respect um, and value. Uh, but basically, at the end of it was, and take those PFDs and and give them to the university. So it's not it's not, and 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 we've all seen the same thing on the K through 12 side. Here's here's the question. That if, if I had been Dunleavy, and you know the world's a better place because I'm not, but if if I'd been in that room, um, standing there in front of the in front of the Medicare or Medicaid providers, um, and they'd started into this, my the question I would have asked is, okay, you want you want us to take you want us to take this money now that's an income tax, taking this money out of the hands of of Alaska families that's an income tax. Of roughly seven percent on the median Alaska family, the Alaska family, average Alaska family earning median income, nine percent, nine point seven percent on a middle income Alaska family, thirty percent on on the lowest income Alaska family. Are you prepared? Are you, you know, doctor so and so? Are you willing to pay a tax equal to that to do this funding to to, to fund to fund your business? Or to Joe Beadle, are you willing to pay a 30% tax? What you want to impose on the lowest income Alaska family, or, or right. heck, even you know 10%? What you want to impose on the on a middle income Alaska family? Are you willing to pay that as a tax yourself? Right. To fund this on the people you're purporting to be in support of and wanting to protect from themselves for their yep. big screen TVs and everything else. Right. I mean, their snow machines and their big screens. Um, are, are you willing to are you willing are you willing to step up and pay that tax? And the answer is going to be of course not. We shouldn't we shouldn't have to do that. You know, if there's enough money in government. Well, there's enough money in government because you're taking it out of people's pockets. You're taxing Alaskans and only Alaskans by the way. You're not even taxing non-residents who are who are working up here, who are working up here and and taking a significant amount of Alaska income out the door without Without contributing to the state, boom. Are you are you, are you willing to pay the same tax that you're advocating imposing on all the all, all the Alaskans, right? Uh, yourself uh, to 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 fund these things, Mike. And, drop. The, and the answer is going to be no. I right. mean, the answer is obviously going to be no. Why why aren't you on Dunleavy's team? I mean, you should be out there whispering that in his ear because that would have been like a mic drop moment as he's like are you willing to pay that the seven to to 36 percent tax that no i mean i'm peace out i'm gone i mean that would have been it right there uh i mean it, the, the hypocrisy of this just really tears me up again don't tax you don't tax me tax the man behind the tree well the guy behind the tree is all of us that's the thing that nobody's looking at. And really, those of us who are in the middle to lower income brackets are the ones that are being affected the most. And they're like, oh, don't you know, we're doing it for your own good. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's 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 I mean, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that the difference. I mean, the facial difference when I when I talk to people over lunch or or talk to them out, you know, out while eating dinner, the, the facial difference that comes over their face. And I say, okay, fine. I, I understand, I understand your argument that, that this, this particular spending, the university K through 12 Medicaid, heck the libraries. I mean, pick whatever you want uh, that, that they're railing on about. I understand that you think that's critically important. All right. Are you willing to pay uh, a 10 
to 20 to 30 percent tax to fund that and i'm and and the look on their face just totally changes it's like well of course not and and so the response is, well, then why do you want middle and lower income Alaskans to pay that? I mean, all you're doing is shoving a responsibility you don't want to pay over on them. Right. And then and then the discussion will get a little bit interesting uh, because then I will say, OK, well, how about this? How about everybody pays a five percent tax, flat tax? And and not only does everybody pay that, everybody in the state pay that. We are able to reduce it to five percent from something that would be significant, would be higher, because we're going to assess that also on non-residents. Well, five percent's a little high. Okay, so we got to cut it someplace. Where you want to cut it? <laughs> yeah, but that thirty-six percent—that's just okay as long as it's not me. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Th this entire debate has been has not been about cutting costs. Or cutting spending. This entire debate is has been about who can I shove these costs off on. Yeah, I mean that's that's been von Emhoff from day one. Cost I shifting, yeah. it, but but I can find I can find all these middle and lower income people right. that I can that I can shove the costs off on. Right, because if or, you because if you charge the cost to all my friends who are all the higher income earners, they'll leave. Well, yeah. good for them because they can afford to leave. All the rest of us are in the middle and lower incomes. We can't afford to leave, so we're stuck with it. Yeah, and they won't leave actually, but but it's I mean they might leave at thirty percent, but at five percent, four percent, three percent, they're not going to leave. They can have all these things they want uh, without shoving the costs off on somebody else. I mean, there's other examples, right? So you, every once in a while, I get stuck in a conversation with somebody who says oil companies, oil companies bad, uh, so we need to tax the oil companies, and 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 it's just that's just another form of finding somebody else to shove it off on. We are not going to, this, this goes back to my flat tax rent, right? We are not going to get this spending problem solved until everybody gets in the game of having to pay something to, 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 to fund government. As long as government's a free good to, to somebody, they're going to be out there ranting about, I want more of it. I right. want more Medicaid. I want more university. I want more K through 12. I want more libraries. I want more ferries. As long as they're able to shove the costs off on somebody else, right? we're going to continue to have those rants. Brad Keithley is the director of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, and uh, we're talking about his weekly top three, which is number one, obviously, Getting me spun up this morning again, um, and, and again, just the again the final my final say on this one, Brad. Just the hypocrisy of saying, you know, you would see fit to take that money that people so they can buy more snow machines and or flat screens and put it into their health care because they obviously know better than me or you or anybody else out there how to spend that money. That is the height of hubris. Well. And, and let's go into the garages of all these doctors, right? What have they got? They've got boats. They've got snow machines. They've got flat screen oh, wait, I Wait, I earned that. I Wait, I earned that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, so much, so much anger boiling to the surface. That's number one. I think we should move on before I, we spin out of control here. Uh, <laughs> number, two, number two of your weekly top. Was that anything else you wanted to add on that number one? Or are you are you done with that? No, it's just I, that's the question. Whenever you get into these conversations, that's the question. Are you willing to pay the same ten to thirty percent tax um, uh, to fund these things that you're trying to? Uh, push off on somebody else arming arming the listeners out there with more information the next time they get in an argument that's the perfect one right there number two it wasn't just the doctors obviously we've got our own supposedly conservative senators who are out there saying oh no you couldn't that's way too much money for you we need that senator chris birch had a, an opinion piece in the adn talking about how well it's a dividend that alaska can afford even though uh, I love the fact that you posted a snapshot of the statute the other day. It says, shall transfer, and they've completely and blatantly ignored that for their own whims. Chris Birch's opinion piece, your thoughts? Well, it's it, it, Birch is trying to upend, as, as has Von Imhoff from the outset, they're trying to upend how, how the statutory system works, right? They're trying to say that the statute says that, that the dividend is whatever's left over. 
and and that that the entitlement um, and and the expectation of Alaskans ought to be that we're going to spend all the money we need for government, and then if we have some left over, uh, then we will trickle it down uh, in the form of a dividend. Um, and and the opinion piece basically goes through a, that analysis. It says the dividend is uh, the uh, the marginal spend. Uh, and that if we it, if there is a dividend, it ought to be it ought to be the part that's left over. The part that Alaska can afford is is the amount that's left over. That's just I mean, what 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 he says is K through 12, university, uh, libraries, uh, ferries, everything else has has a priority over the dividend, has a call over the dividend, um, and that the dividend is the last thing in, and so it it's the thing that ought to be cut. Uh, the most, and and in in and Birch has said in the past that he thinks we're moving to a position where uh, we're gonna we're gonna lose the dividend entirely. We'll be talking in the third segment about how that occurs, but it's it's always it's always the last thing in. That's not how the statutory system works. The statutory system says there's a formula for K through 12. There's a formula for Medicaid. Um, and and you and and we ought to observe them. And and there, there's a statutory formula that ought to be observed. And 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 Birch is all right. He's fine with that. But when you get to the statute that governs the dividend, he says, "Oh no, we ought to ignore that. It ought to be you know it ought to be something less. It ought to be whatever's left over." And and for a, a, a legislator to go out go around claiming that statutes can be ignored, should be ignored, it's an obligation to ignore them, which is basically what he's saying. Is really, I mean, you, you, we're, we're governed by laws. We're supposed to be governed by laws, right? And and we now have a legislator saying out there, "Oh, just ignore the law, um, <laughs> and 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 pay whatever we have uh, left over uh, at the end." And on the floor, I mean, we all know this, but on the floor, when the when the budget bill came up to the Senate, um, Birch proposed an amendment that would have reduced the dividend down to twelve hundred dollars. Now, fortunately, it was defeated. Um, uh, 17 to 3, I think, was the vote. Um, and he and Natasha and uh, and the senator from uh, Jesse Keel from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Juno were the only three voting in favor of it. But he proposed a vote that would do that very thing in the face of the statute sitting out there. So it's right. I, you know, you you can't claim you cannot claim to be a conservative if if you just you know blithely ignore the laws. You're either a nation of laws or we're not. We're a nation. We're a nation of arbitrary you know get up in the morning and do whatever the hell you want to do um and and birch's birch's attempt to subvert to reverse uh the statutory uh scheme uh i think is just uh, is is disappointing uh even when it, when it comes out of the mouth of somebody else but it's certainly disappointing when it comes out of the mouth of a legislator a la, a la, brad keithley is with alaskans for a sustainable budget um again on our way out here brad we're still talking about number two, but I'm going to read this, and it's up on the screen right now for folks who want to go back and watch the video. Alaska Statute AS 37.13.145, Section B. At the end of each fiscal year, the corporation, that's the Permanent Fund Corporation, shall transfer from the earnings reserve account to the dividend fund established under statute 50% of the income available for distribution under the statute. It shall transfer 50%. It says nothing about what's left over. It says shall transfer 50%. It is the law, but apparently only if you feel like it's really a suggestion. It is so blatant and so clear here that the legislature has decided, I mean, with the collusion of Governor Walker, I mean, he was really the one that that saw this, that took this opportunity, that moved it from DGF to UGF to count it as general income, and then gave them the political cover to do this. And, of course, they had the opportunity to override. You, They could have overridden the governor's veto of the PFD to begin with, but there was just too many people in there, many of them who remain here today who just believe that that, oh, they saw that, that's just a big, juicy pot of money. We need that. Yeah, we need that. We need that for government programs. Uh, we need to tax it. Uh, it's, it's sitting out there. I mean, the thing about the PFD that, that really is sort of infuriating is it's it's individuals money under the statute. It's individuals money, individual Alaskans money that has to run through government hands on its way on its way to the individuals. Um, 
and and it's like your stockbroker, right? It's like your stockbroker. Um, the 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 money you get from dividends and from and from various investments come through your stockbroker's hands on their on their way uh, to you. And it's like your and the state is acting like your stockbroker and saying, ah, yeah, you don't really need all that money that that you've invested. Uh, you don't really need all that money that has your name on it. Uh, I'll just take a little bit of it. Oh, I'll take a little bit more. I'll take a little bit more. Um, and and I have a friend who said, yeah, but the state's providing services. Well, a stockbroker easily could say, oh, and I'm going to provide you some more analysis, or I'm going to, right. you know, I'm going to, I'm going to devote some more effort to your to your account to justify all this additional money that I'm taking. Right. It's just the state's diverting um, uh, money that is intended for uh, that that under the statute is intended for the individuals. And you know, sometimes I get into a debate with people about. Uh, when I say it's a tax, well, it's not a tax. It's the government just holding back what it, you know, what, what's government's money. We call okay. that withholding is what we call that. We call that withholding. It's a tax. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. It's a tax. And then, and then, you know, Birch will go out there and say, well, we can't tax people just to pay a dividend. No, we're already taxing the dividend. We already have a tax, Chris. We already have government taking money. That's intended for that that that's that's lawfully entitled to to individuals, which is a tax. All a, a, a another tax would do, all a different tax would do, is substitute for the tax we've already got. And the tax we've already, the tax we've got, the PFD tax, is the most regressive, has the largest adverse impact of all of the various revenue options on the overall Alaska economy. Is by far the costliest to Alaska families. Result in, in results in increased. I mean, you can go down the litany, the increased poverty. You, you can go down the list of the things that ICER has analyzed and, and told us about about the effect of PFD cuts. It is it is the worst form of taxation you can come up with. No other no state. Try to tries to finance their government on a head tax. I mean, they they'd be laughed out of the business, right? Uh, 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 if they if any state tried to uh, impose a head tax as, as as a significant form of of generating revenue, but we're doing it in Alaska. We're doing a head tax as as one of our is one of our significant forms of of revenue raising. So all a, all a tax would do, another form of tax would do is supplant. This very regressive head ca head tax, uh, poverty increasing, economy hurting uh, head tax that we that we've put in place, uh, we would supplant it with a fair, more efficient, uh, more economically advantageous uh, advantageous system. It's not it's not that we would have be having tax to increase the PFD. It would be we're having a better tax system. To replace the horrible taxes, right? We're spreading uh, that the we burden. Put in place through PFD cuts, right? We're spreading the burden more equally at that point, and, and unfortunately, this is where we're at in having this debate about which tax to use instead of, you know, why do we even need a tax because we could live within our means? That seems to have been thrown out the window. But what really opens people's eyes is when you describe to them because most people in this state do not understand how the state is funded. They they just have no clue. Uh, and when you point out to them that first and foremost, there's a hidden tax in the form of the state receiving 75 percent of all revenues, period. Boom. We just we never see any of it. Twenty five percent then goes into the permanent fund and we receive a sliver of that. We receive a sliver. We receive a portion of the earnings of that deposited 25 percent. But they take 75 percent right off the front. Then they want another 50 or 75 or 80 or 100 percent of what's on the back i mean they're already getting all that lucre up front oh michael it's even worse than that they're taking 75 percent of royalties they're taking a hundred percent of the of the uh ta of the uh, production tax revenue so it's not it's not just 75 it's not 75 percent of what the oil companies are producing it is it is about 90 to 95 percent once you count the production tax of what the oil companies are producing. We're, we're running up against the break here, but I we I think we need to touch on that again here when we come back. Brad Keithley is the director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He is a former oil and gas consultant, comes in and talks with us every week. Uh, he founded this organization to help try and keep us back, uh, get us back on track with our finances here in the state of Alaska. And we will uh, we're going to continue with him here on his weekly top three. But we just you know tripped over something in the uh, in the in between time here with the chat room on Facebook. 
that I, I do want to explore because Brad was talking about taxation and stock managers or money market account managers that if they came to you and said, um, hey, we were going to give you all of your dividend money that you earn from your money market account, but we really had some higher expenses and we needed it. You know, would you stay with them? And then I started talking about the real cost. People in the state don't understand how the state makes its money, how it gets its revenue. I mean, first and foremost, they get the lion's share on the front, 75%, 25% deposited into the permanent fund, and we get a slice of that money. So they're already getting 75% plus 25. And Brad said, no, no, it's even worse than that. Brad, give us the real rundown. Well, the 75%, 25% split is of the royalty. That's of the that's of the royalty that's paid by the oil companies uh, on their revenues. But there's but there's several other layers of revenues taken from the oil companies on top of that. Uh, the production tax is the most is the most notable. Um, uh, SB 21 is the production tax we currently have. ACES used to be the production tax system we currently have, but that's that's on top of this 75% split. And there's property tax on top of that, and there's a corporate income tax on the oil companies, um, on focused on the oil companies on on top of that. All of that additional money, the the production tax, the property tax, and the corporate income tax, all of that, 100% of that goes to the state. None of that comes through uh, the PFD. So it's not only the 75-25 split, and then the 25 is then split again when it comes out in, in the form of earnings between state, state government and the individuals. It's not only that split, but all of the additional uh, uh, revenues that go to the go to the state. So uh, the taxes that go to the state. So the ultimate split uh, is is in the neighborhood. I did these figures once, but it's been a while. Is in the neighborhood of 90 to 95 percent of oil industry revenues are going to state government. And and the remaining, you know, five to seven and a half or so uh, percent is what's going going to the individuals. But it's just not enough, Brad. We just need a little bit. If we only had a little bit more, we could fix everything. That seems to be the <laughs> that seems to be the answer here. Unfortunately, I don't think it will ever be enough. Uh, and that's why we have the third of your top three, which is about talking about the spending caps. Uh, the Daily News Miner had an opinion piece. Uh, talking about, you know, a caution on spending caps. And they go into an analogy about how it's all great to live within your means, but what what, what happens when you can't live within your means and you, you just are not able to, then what do you do? Uh, and it talks about having a spending cap. And before you jump into it, my only comment on this whole article was essentially, you notice how they say nothing about the spending cap in Fairbanks or the one down in the peninsula <laughs> or the one anywhere else. The one in Fairbanks has been shown statistically and numerically to have saved the borough residents upwards of a quarter of a billion dollars over the last 25 or 30 years based on that downward pressure of government, uh, which is a significant savings for a small community like Fairbanks. Yeah. Well, I yeah, it's it's, it's odd that they didn't mention that. Um <laughs> I, I am I am one hundred percent fully in favor of a spending cap, but all of the spending cap options that are on the table now don't work. None of none of them work, and all of them, frankly, are wastes of time. The reason is all of them are based on appropriations. So uh, let's take the Senate's for example. And the Senate starts at five billion dollars because that's the most the 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 one proposed by um, uh, Senator von Imhoff and Senator Simon. That that starts at five billion dollars. Currently starts at five billion dollars, and then is ratcheted up uh, for inflation. The five billion dollars is representative of current, uh, roughly current appropriations, what they think current appropriations should be, including capital budget, and then it's and then it's ratcheted up from that. The governors starts at a different base and has a somewhat di the original one had a somewhat different ratchet but it started from an appropriations base and then ratcheted up by uh, uh, inflation and and population uh, uh, changes all of these are starting with appropriations bases right well the appropriations uh, are are assume a certain level of revenues uh, but those revenues don't aren't aren't they, they aren't guaranteed to show up 
Right. Oil prices go up, oil prices go down. As we're going to find as we get into this, investment returns go up and investment returns go down. The the spending caps by by starting them with appropriations and then ratcheting up them up by inflation don't have any relationship, aren't maintaining any relationship to revenues. So if we get out there two or three or four or five years and oil prices go back down again, and let's say it's during a cycle that investment uh, earnings, investment returns are down again, or or the the corpus of the we have a recession and the corpus of the uh, of the of the permanent fund shrinks and the five percent is of a lower number, and so the amount coming to government and the amount going to the, the dividend is a lower number. But the appropriations, the the spending cap that we're that we're talking about keeps ratcheting up, keeps on right. going up. It doesn't reflect those lower revenues. So we're we're not really we're not really uh, in in these various spending caps, we're not really capturing uh, what our revenues are going to be. Governor Dunleavy started uh, this session by talking about we're going to match spending to revenues, right? And then and then he promptly proposed a spending cap that doesn't do that. Right. It seems yeah. antithetical. I mean, that was my first impression was that this seems really antithetical to what he was talking about in making our incomes and our outgoes all match up when you're doing this spending cap. Uh, none of the other spending caps are, are you know, kind of based on this. You have to have it based on if it's zero based budgeting, which is what he was kind of shooting for. Then you have to start with what revenue is available and work from there. Yep, exactly right. And 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 you can you you can do. I mean, I've I've proposed one um, uh, and have posted it. You can repost it, but you can do one that's fairly simple based based on revenues. Just sort of the trailing average of the last five years' revenues, uh, with some with some boundaries on it to make sure that no one year jumps up or jumps down. You can you. It's fairly easy to calculate them. Easy. It's not fairly easy. It's easy to calculate them based on revenues. But all we're doing all we're doing with what we've got on the table now. Uh, is recreating the problem that we have with the current with the current spending cap we have in the Constitution, which is appropriation based. It over time it started from a very high base and spiraled off, um, uh, and now it's, it's way above you know anything that we that we can support through revenues. It, the, the people will say, well, we're doing it better this time because we're starting with a lower base. Yeah, we're starting with a lower base, but what's to what's to guarantee? That the revenue stream we have now uh, uh, is going to remain as strong as it is now. Right. And if and if the revenue stream declines, we ought we should be having a cap that captures that and tells us we need to ratchet down uh, our spending, or else we're going to get ourselves right back into the same problem we've had since since 2014 when oil prices went down. Uh, but we've continued to spend at the same level because we had those reserves. We're going to go right back into that same situation. So, as it stands right now, frankly, from my view, all of these all of these efforts at spending caps are just a waste. I mean, I I, I would oppose them because because they're just you know they're sort of they're, they're sort of make work uh, feel good uh, uh, steps that people will tell themselves are going to capture spending. But in, but in actuality, they don't. Final thoughts here as we get ready to wrap the last three or four minutes here. You know, what do we need to be doing as we watch this stuff go on? Uh, I mean, other than, I guess, encouraging our senators and our legislators to make that amendment change. We talked to Mike Schauer about making the amendment change uh, for the uh, for the constitutional uh, spending cap, making it revenues instead of uh, uh, appropriations. And he seemed receptive to that idea and understood what we were talking about. In fact, his comment was, I hadn't even thought of that, which a uh, good. I'm glad that's why we've got we got crowdsourcing of brain power out here. Uh, what uh, what else can we be doing? Well, I, I it, it, with all of these things, it is it stay in touch with your with your legislators, as I as I am sure. Uh, Representative Jackson and, and Representative Sullivan Leonard would say uh, they uh, they benefit from having that contact from constituents, knowing what their constituents are concerned about. And as we saw with Senator Bacecki during the last election cycle, certainly uh, uh, constituents can have an influence on uh, on a on a on a legislator's thinking. There's one other point about the spending cap that I think is important, and 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 typically uh, people don't want to talk about it uh, uh, as much as the as the other point about that revenues might spiral down, but spending caps um, 
can also essentially reduce the flexibility. Um, Appropriation-based spending caps can reduce the flexibility that people have to determine their own lives. Let's say 10 years from now that uh, uh, revenues have still stayed healthy, but but those who are here 10 years from now decide uh, in 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 you know in in vote that they want to tax themselves. They want to increase revenue for a specific purpose. Climate change. I mean I mean pick it pick an issue. Uh, they decide by vote that they want to uh, that they're willing to make contributions uh, in, for, in the form of taxes to government and increase revenue. Well, an appropriations based cap essentially would prevent them from doing that. If the appropriations are coming off the five billion dollar base uh, and they're they're ratcheting up, uh, the cap is ratcheting up only at the rate of inflation. If 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 other revenues have sort of maintained track with that, the people ten years from now would be prohibited, essentially prohibited, from from raising additional revenues because they wouldn't. The appropriations cap would prevent them from spending it. Now that's I mean we may we in this decade we in this generation may say. Oh, that's okay. That's fiscally conservative. We don't want them to spend it, but people get to make a choice, right? I mean, that's that's sort of the the fundamental concept of democracy. People get to make a choice, and if people ten years, fifteen, twenty years from now want to make that choice to increase the amount of revenues that they're giving government, if that's what they decide to do, we should let them be able to do that, right? Uh, we should we should not prevent them from doing that, right? So and and an appropriations cap uh, would do that. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know if climate change was the favorite one, but, you know, if you want to pick a library initiative or something out there that people really want to get behind and everybody can kind of do it, the problem is if they're bumping up against that appropriation limit, no soup for you. Sorry, can't do it because of all this other government spending we have, which, again, points us back to the idea that the revenue cap is the one that's the most sustainable in the long run. It is. It is. And it's the one it's the one that that I mean, up or down it's the one that reflects reality. Appropriation based caps just spin off on their own. And I mean, you, you would hope that revenue you would love that revenue would stay that stable and it would increase it at the rate of inflation and everything would work fine and dandy. But revenue doesn't do that, particularly when you have a commodity based uh, 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 revenue system like we have in Alaska with with oil and um, and and investment uh, income is going to be you know we're going to have ups and we're going to have downs and if we don't have a cap that that works uh, during both of those uh, then you know the cap's just going to be ignored or it's going to it's going to become uh, a, 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 a an impediment. Uh, to making government work efficiently. Are you seeing any reaction? I mean, I know that you've been writing a lot. We've been talking a lot. I know that you get you repost our videos and everything else. Have you had any conversations with any legislators or movers or shakers down there as to the fact that we're making headway here? We got about ninety seconds. I uh, on on this issue, Senator Shower and has talked about it, uh, and I've talked to people in the administration. Uh, I, I would hope as people get focused, as we sort of move away from the budget and people start focusing on spending caps, that that conversation will get richer and deeper. Um, it, I'm, I'm a little concerned that spending caps all of a sudden at the end of the session, people grab up them, grab them up and say, oh, we need to do this too, um, and, and throw them out there. That's why I'm raising the issue now. Um, but there are those in the administration that I talk to regularly that uh, uh, understand the point. I've worked. I've worked on a proposal that would uh, 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 be a be a workable uh, revenue-based cap, and I've given that to them. I've given that to Senator Shower. So, you know, hopefully, it's part of the conversation when we when we when we get around to being focused on spending caps. I'm uh, the reason I'm talking about it now is I'm just concerned that at the end of the session, people are going to grab it up as as a as a you know an add-on without really thinking about what they're doing. Right, exactly, the long-term ramifications, which, again, seems to be our problem in this government, this lack of long-term thinking of that's fine for this year, but what happens five years or 10 years or 15 or 20 years down the road? It's the unintended consequences that always come back and bite us in the ass, and this is the problem with what we've had going on. And doing a last-minute Charlie thing with this would not uh, would not serve us well in that regard. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, as always, my friend, so good to talk with you. We appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. 
Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.